Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalship.net slash 164, and you can email the show pedalshift at pedalship.net or call the voicemail hotline 202-930-1109 and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 164th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. I am Tim Mooney, and I am just off of my bike, but I am recording this way beforehand because I'm not sure exactly how easy it would have been to have gotten out the first edition of Tour Journals Volume 14, but I hope that all of you have been following along. I hope you all enjoyed seeing all the images, the pictures, and things like that. I'm going to do my darndest, my best bet, to start Tour Journals Volume 14 starting next week as you are hearing this right now. It's going to be uh, basically in a bunch of segments that's going to go through the end of the month and into June as well. Really looking forward to sharing that all with you because as I'm sitting here right now, I haven't even ridden one freaking mile of it yet. So I would like to know how it goes. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this is going to be a fun episode. I had a really fun opportunity to reconnect with an old friend who is doing some really amazing things out in the adventuring world. And her name is Maggie Lonergan. Now, Maggie and I go way back. She used to work for the yoga studio that my girlfriend owned and I helped run for over 10 years. And the fun part about it is that Maggie came on board as sort of uh, uh, somebody who helped run the studio and then eventually became a teacher. So she did all sorts of cool things for the studio, and we got to know each other over the years. So after she moved away, she had an opportunity to start doing a lot more of her adventuring. Um, She started off in racing bikes, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the show. But what she's been doing lately is really exciting. And we're going to talk specifically about her taking a touring bike and throwing it onto a raft. Well, actually, bringing the raft on the touring bike, biking to a place, taking the raft out, pumping it up, throwing the bike on the raft, and then doing some paddling. So it's it's called pack rafting or bike rafting. There's all sorts of different names for it. Something that I've been really intrigued about doing, and I thought it would be something to share with all of you. So let's learn a little bit about Maggie. Maggie Lonergan lives in San Francisco, still holding on to her New England ways. She spent the last decade learning to balance big adventures with explorations in daily life. She spends her work weeks exploring the Bay Area in the water and by bike, occasionally taking a long hike up a mountain that is too daunting to ride up. She named her website after her yoga teaching business, Hiccuping Yogi, as a nod to her chronic hiccups. She treats it as a frequent reminder that sometimes things happen that we can't control. Although she doesn't teach much these days, she's kept the name because her adventure background started with thousands of hours on the yoga mat, and it's a good reminder that everything comes back to the breath. I've been uh, wanting to talk about bike rafting for an insanely long period of time, mainly because it's one of those things that seems so out of the ordinary and there's not a ton of information about it. And it just so happens that I know somebody who has recently done a bike rafting trip. I'm on the line right now with Maggie Lonergan. She and I go way back to to prior past lives. But uh, Maggie, welcome to the show. And I'm super excited to uh, talk bike rafting with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, let, let's let's kind of set the table a little bit for folks who are listening. Your adventure background is pretty fascinating, at least to me. Uh, and we'll talk about the bike rafting in Colorado later on. But you've got a pretty eclectic background from, you know, racing up the steps of towers to racing bikes in a more traditional sense. What's sort of your adventure kind of racy kind of, I don't know, your your, your adventure arc? What's that all been like? And, and how did you kind of find yourself from where you were back then to where you are now? Yeah, so I think it's it's somewhat non-traditional compared to like a lot of people you see there. Um, like I grew up in a family that was very not outdoorsy, not really into traveling and stuff, but very much into like the idea of it. So I grew up around like National Geographic and adventure stories and everything. Um, and then really kind of what started when I was in, in college, I, start, that's when I started practicing yoga, which, you know, that's how I ended up meeting you. and through my yoga practice kind of really got into myself and into like my breathing and into more meditation type of things. And when I was in Thailand, um, I was 
24 and I had gone to Thailand to just bum around for a couple months and I started free diving. And a lot of free diving uses a lot of the same techniques from yoga where it's kind of like really quieting the mind and taking these, you know, really controlling your breathing to control the body. And using those techniques in the water, it kind of hit me that like I can take all the stuff that I already know from like a very kind of indoor inside existence and use it to really like push myself into really kind of crazy places in the world, like deep underwater or, you know, just riding bikes around. So from there, that's when I kind of switched into the more outdoor mode and moved to California, started riding my bike around and really got into like bike racing because I had a day job and wasn't going too far. So I was just racing on the weekends and riding bikes all the time. And eventually just kind of, I ended up getting injured racing bikes. And part of my recovery was just riding bikes really slowly. And it was a lot more fun and I could do a lot more fun things that way. And I still really enjoy racing, but I just, I put more of the time into like this bike packing and bike porn type of thing rather than, you know, getting super fast on the bike. I don't know which side is the dark side, but I'm going to say that that our side or, or the slower side is the dark side. So welcome to the dark side because <laughs> uh, I Thanks. feel like it's so much because because racing is it can be really fun. But it's you're I mean, with an injury or something like that, you know, you realize that. It, it, there's some limitations there has to be well there has to be a race and there there's all these other things and if it's just you and a bike and you know a straight line or a big curvy line depending on where you're going you know you can do it anytime any place anywhere and sort of define the challenges as it goes is is that sort of what you're finding to be what's drawing you or continuing to draw you in that direction the fact that you can kind of create these different combinations of challenges or what what's what's sort of what's what's yeah. the draw right now yeah, so a lot of, I mean, even my old, uh, like, teammates know that I was always the one who was, like, trying to stop to pick berries on the side of the road and, you know, take a nap because, you know, it was a nice day and it's, it seems like a great spot for a nap, right, instead of, like, racing your bike around. So there's always a bit of a draw on my end anyways, but I think a lot of it is just you can really, you know, using bikes, you can go on these crazy big adventures and, like, you know, like, I'm going to go travel around Scandinavia for the summer, but even like just last night, I rode my bike 10 miles away from my house up into the Marin Headlands and just slept up there. And, you know, it's beautiful up there. People travel from all over the world to come up there. And it's it's an hour away from, I mean, just to get to the edge of it, it's 20 minutes from my house. So going on these kind of slower rides, you can just see, I think just appreciate like the local area a lot more. And when I was injured, like that's all I really could do because I, I had a really bad concussion. So I could only really stay awake for about an hour at a time. So, you know, I, I really learned what was within an hour of my house at that point. And then I guess you had to take a big nap or something. I mean, that's just concussions exactly. are the worst. <laughs> I mean, I, that is just terrible. But I'm glad. Yeah. But it's good. I mean, at least I, the the silver lining to the injury is that you ended up being able to pivot and find something that is at least as life affirming as maybe racing was. And I don't know. Maybe maybe it's more. What 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 do you think? Can you yeah. at this early stage can you say that you prefer one over the other, or is it just so different that it's just a different thing, different time of life? Yeah, I think I def I prefer. Um, kind of this more, you know, adventure type cycling um, is a little bit more just kind of me, but racing and stuff is just, it's really fun. Um, you know, if I didn't have to put so much time into training to be good at it in order to enjoy it, um, I'd be racing all the time now. It's just, you kind of have to be at a certain level in order it, it, for me to like really enjoy it. So if you can't put the time in to be a good racer, then it's just not as much is not as much of a draw. Whereas bike touring, you know, you can be in the worst shape of your life. You could be super fit. Like you can still go have a good time regardless of how fit you are. Some folks even just ride their way into their fitness. You know, I've talked about this on the show exactly. before, you know, yeah, it's like, you know, you, you can go right from couch to tour if you want to. Now you might not enjoy it as much in the first few days, but you know, it's there for you right. if you want. But you do get there eventually. Absolutely. I mean, and almost by design. I mean, if you're going to be going 40, 50, 60 miles in a day, you're, you're going to get into some kind of shape relatively quickly just by the virtue of going from point A to point B over the course of a few days. So yeah, it all works out. Yeah. And even when I was racing, I always do a big block um, of a, I do like a week or two tour before um, training season really started just to get like the base fitness there. 
Oh, so you use touring before as sort of a preview to your training season? Is that it? a little bit? Yeah, I go do like I go ride a section of the coast or something like just a you know a one week kind of thing, like do a, you know three hundred, four hundred miles, kind of nice and not super crazy fast, but like with all my bags and everything. Yeah, yeah. So you get a little bit of weight to get hills. Oh, that's a good that's a, that's a great idea. I I, I think that it's funny. I, I think there was somebody in one of my comments on one of the socials uh, recently said that it was uh, that touring was a really great. Oh, no, actually, it was a podcast uh, review. Somebody said, hey, uh, touring is really great training for racing. So that you're the second person who has said that to me. Yeah. So I, that never really occurred to me, but it makes a ton of sense. Would you concern, consider your current kind of touring mode to be more bikepacking centric? And, and if so, or regardless of what you would characterize it as, what's sort of an ideal trip for you kind of in the here and now? Yeah, so... I definitely consider myself a little more in like the traditional touring setup. Um, like I have them and, and again, it's a little bit what the aim is like locally, I've been doing a bit more of the bike packing, um, taking the mountain bike out with the, just strapping everything to the frame and whatnot. Um, as kind of like overnights or like two night kind of trips, but like really locally, um, kind of my ideal trip right now that I'll be leaving on in a couple of weeks, um, is I'm taking my, my road bike and, loading up very traditional kind of pannier, four pannier setup and just taking up to the Arctic. Um, so flying into Norway and then riding north and then just coming south through kind of the forests in Lapland. And the idea there, mostly being on roads, like I have the bike set up a little bit to handle, you know, off-road, but nothing too technical. And that way it's a little bit more, I think it's a little more sustainable um, for me, just, you know, you're not, off in the woods, like, especially when you, tra- I do most of my traveling solo. So, you know, just being around towns and stuff, you're around people a little bit more. Um, I think it's a pretty good flexible setup to get away for as long as I want to, but still be able to travel close to people very easily. Yeah. When I was looking at the post that you did uh, about the, the bike rafting trip that we're going to be talking about, I noticed you do kind of a, a little bit of a hybrid thing. You know, you've, you've got traditional panniers, but you've also got some of the new, uh, frame bags and things like that that we're starting to see in the bike packing yeah. kind of setup and I, I mean I'm starting to do the same thing where it's it, there's kind of a best of both worlds type of a thing I, I tend to not have a handlebar bag anymore because I put what it was in my handlebar bag into a frame bag instead so it just frees things up on front so you know it's I, I'm glad that that you mentioned that because or the, the type of gear that you're using because I think that we're so focused on labels and of course i just did it by asking if you're more of a bike packer but you know yeah. i think i think <laughs> this kind of merger of different styles you kind of take the bags that make the most sense for whatever ride you're going to be on so if you're going to be needing to carry more gear then maybe you go with a four pannier setup if it's just an overnight maybe you can get away with just a frame bag so it it all works out really well yeah exactly i want to get into this bike rafting trip and the the genesis mm-hmm. of the bike rafting or, well, I, I should back up. I know that this was meant as kind of a tune-up for the Arctic Circle ride that you just referenced. But what was the genesis of getting into bike rafting altogether for you? What what sort of prompted you to go in that direction? Because it's it's unusual, but it's been done by a lot of folks in, in the true kind of adventure spirit place. Is that where you got your... I don't know, the the idea from, or how did you walk that path to get to, hey, I'm going to bring an inflatable raft with me and I'm going to do something with my bike and vice versa. Yeah. So it sort of came from partly in my head. And then I kind of found this like bike rafting stuff. You know, a a lot of it's really up in Alaska, um, you know, really off grid type of thing. But I've always been, I've always been a water bomb and specifically like just not been able to leave the coast so i mean that's why you haven't seen me out in dc for several years now i've just i've kind of hit the point in my life i don't want to live more than a few miles from the beach and that's it so um i kind of had this idea in my head of like how how do i combine these two things like being a total beach bum and really enjoying like doing these bike trips um because especially a lot of these coastal routes and you end up having to do a ton of miles more than like kind of crow flight distance just because of how the coastline is. And so a couple of years ago, I ended up buying an inflatable um, stand-up paddleboard. And I was doing these trips up in Tomales Bay, which is up in like Point Reyes, uh, about an hour drive north of San Francisco. And 
we'd take the paddle boards and inflate them and paddle across the bay and do some camping out there. And I'd done a ton of bike riding up there and I just, I kept trying to figure out like, how can I get a bike on this board? How can I somehow combine these trips? But the, the inflatable paddle boards are great if you like live in an apartment and you need to drive your board around, but they're not, they're still pretty unwieldy and I wouldn't take it on a bike. So somehow, and I don't, I really don't remember exactly how I found this, but somehow like this pack rafting business showed up. I found it on the internet and it just kind of clicked. I was like, this is exactly what I've been trying to do um, with a standard up paddle board, except the pack rafts are made for, you know, hiking and off grid expeditions. So they're super small, packable, um, easy to handle not necessarily the best watercraft, um, although they're very capable watercraft. And eventually I just kind of went down the rabbit hole and found these guys up in Alaska who've been doing this for decades at this point. Um, And so finally I just pulled the trigger and bought one and I just been messing around with it ever since. Tell me more about the nature of the raft itself, because it sounds like that it's, it's, it's small. It can, pack down to a relatively small amount but it's it's enough to be able to carry you your gear and your bike most importantly all kind of at once is it does it behave like more like a canoe or a kayak um like well, like how how uh, much did you have to get any kind of an additional uh paddling experience i mean it sounds like that you've had that but like is this something that any schlub AKA me can pick up with, you know, a reasonable amount of canoeing experience, or is this something that you kind of need to know how to do uh, Eskimo rolls or whatever, whatever they're called these days for kayaking, you know, what, what's, what's the deal with it? Yeah. So I don't have any like white water kind of rapid experience on, on the river. Um, I, and that's probably why this section of the Colorado river, um, just what was over dam was really appealing to me as kind of a beginner trip because there's no white water there. It was pretty calm currents and everything. Um, I'm definitely like more of a swimmer, so I feel very comfortable in the water, but sitting on top of it, it's a little bit more foreign to me. So I did a couple test trips with the raft, um, just like with no gear and stuff, just lashing the bike down, like just going to pretty local beaches to me on the bay, um, not on the ocean side here because uh, Northern California has some pretty nasty beach currents and surf and stuff. Um, but I found that, you know, it wasn't as easy to handle in the wind, like, because it's, it's inflatable craft, there's really no, dra- uh, it sits on top of the water. So it was a little harder to handle, but these rafts actually are like made to carry all of your gear. So I found the more gear I put in it, the better it handled just because it sat a little bit lower in the water. Um, there was more heft to it. It didn't get built around in the wind as much. So I was glad I had tested it on the bay in wind before having the gear in because then when I got stuck on the Colorado river in a storm with crazy winds, I actually had, it was so much easier to handle because I already had all this stuff in it. It's not the most comfortable once you're sitting in there. Um, you know, you just kind of lash the bike to the bow and stuff all your gear in as best as possible. Um, my raft actually has like a big zipper so I can stuff the gear inside the tube and that helps it a little bit lower in the water and track a bit better. But yeah, it handled great on the river um, in the wind. It was just kind of all my stuff in the raft and I'm kind of sitting on top of it and didn't have any problems. That's really cool. I, I'm excited about the prospect of something like that because it sounds like it, it's really good for maybe short trips. It wouldn't be necessarily something that you could do like super, super long uh, waterway traversing but you know if you need to get across a river or you need to you know wanted to do a a short paddle of a few miles it sounds like this is exactly the type of thing that would be able to do that with all your gear pretty safely and pretty securely in the raft that i have is designed again for much calmer water um the company that makes it um company named alpaca they've been making these rafts for years at this point um they're kind of really the first more like bigger manufacturer in that space and they make these pack rafts for, you know, backcountry whitewater expeditions where you're going to be hiking in, you know, a couple of days to hike into a river that's crazy whitewater. So the, the rafts are definitely designed, um, you know, they handle pretty rough, heavy water if that's what you're looking for. So you can go online and find, you know, these guys bike rafting in Alaska and crazy rapids and it handling just fine. But 
that's definitely not my expertise. So yeah, and crazy Alaskans are cut from a different cloth, and <laughs> you know, I mean, they'll they'll tackle yeah, anything. Exactly. Cool. Okay, so I want to back up then. So you you uh, flew in from the Bay Area, uh, I uh, to get to Vegas to start your trip, and and I think that the coolest part about this trip is that from the second you got to Nevada, you were on bike or you were on the raft uh, for your your complete round trip from Vegas, which I think is super cool. I know that you used a different type of um, uh, bag to get your gear out and to check your bike and all that by dog's body. And I'm curious, you know, how did that work out for you? And, you know, it, it packs down for folks who don't know about this bag. This was the first time I've ever seen it. It packs down to about the size of a loaf of bread, you had said. That's amazing to me. And your bike made it and everything was cool. Tell, tell me more. Or tell me more. I'm excited about this. Yeah, so it's this bag called, um, it's made by a company called Dog's Body. I think they just changed the name of it because that's not what it was called when I um, got it maybe six months ago. But um, it's this Kiwi company called Ground Effect, and they've been making bike gear kind of for like New Zealand mountain biking type of stuff for I think like 20 or 30 years. And I'd never heard of the bag before. I was always looking for something like for this exact reason. Like I want to do... I don't want to have to stash a box somewhere. I don't want to have to find a box the end of, beginning and end of my trip. Like one of the big things that's really annoyed me is that San Francisco airport is actually super bike friendly and has like, you know, places you can build your bike again and pack it down. There's just no way to get a box there. So the idea is like being able to just bring my own bag, ride to the airport, pack my stuff down and then just immediately leave from the airport and not have to worry about this extra procurement step was interesting. So I, I kind of took a, I took a flyer and bought it and it works super well. So the bag is designed specifically for touring bikes. So it's a bit longer than a lot of bo um, boxes that you'll find. And that's super key for touring bikes as, as you well know. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely have like been on the side of the road in Virginia, like trying to jam a, a bike into a tiny little box as I'm running late for my flight. But, or, or worse, taking two boxes and trying to get that extra bit of length by extending a, an existing racing bike box. Oh yeah. <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> yep. Not the best. <laughs> So yeah, it ends up working super well. It's very soft-sided, so there's really no protection. But you know, when you're you tons of stuff, so like I took like an egg, uh, one of those kind of egg carton tabs and lined one side of it with that. Use the panniers to have a bit of a hard side to line the other side of it. Um, I had no problems getting it through. Um, it's a little unwieldy to carry, but as you know, like any any time you put a bike and all your gear in a box, it's going to be a little a little unwieldy. So. Um, yeah, works super well. Oh, I have. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm excited about. It. I may look into getting one potentially because I've had the 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 chance to use a bike bag before, but often I I I, I don't bring my larger touring bike out with me to the West Coast as often as I'd like to because what I end up with is I do, if I do a one way situation I. I have to ship it back or whatever. And if I'm flying Alaska Airlines, I can fly my bike for free. So it's sort of like, okay, well, what can I do to make this all work? So yeah, no, I'm su I'm super stoked about to look into the, all that and all your all the gear, including the raft, all fit in that, which is just amazing. I think so. Yeah, in Alaska, like you said, Alaska has been amazing ever since they officially changed their their policy. Just let you fly everything. So yeah, it's pr it's pretty great. If you've got a free bag, your bike can be your free bag, which is amazing. And and even if you don't, it's only twenty five bucks, which you know compared to other exactly. airlines in the states, it's it's they're doing it right, man. That's why I like them. Uh, so you you get to McCarran, you get your stuff together. I, I'm curious, you know, were you getting a little bit of side eye from from folks at the airport as you're kind of pulling all that stuff together? Or, you know, how did that all go? And how was the ride out of there? Yeah, so I really expected to and didn't at all. Actually, um, I had picked up an oversized luggage and forgot, you know, there's tons of golf courses in the area. So there were actually a lot of there was like the whole um the college golf team there picking up their bags with me. Um, and the only people who really even seemed to notice that I was in the corner of the airport putting my bike together were the bike police in the airport. And they were, they were pretty interested. They're like, Oh, where are you going? Like what are you up to and all that kind of stuff and offering help and everything. So, you know, Las Vegas airport police were great. They're like, can we give you, uh, uh, can we direct you to the rental car place? Because we know that you're going to definitely not be riding yeah. out of here, right? 
yeah, in the, in the airport there, McCarran's really easy to ride in, in and out of. Um, there isn't like a whole lot of complex around it. So it's really just like get on the road and then you're just riding to the airport, riding out of it. Um, I, I knew this because I've walked to the airport in Vegas a couple of times before. So I was, I was fairly comfortable that I'd be able to get in and out of it without having to have a car. Like, I just remember flying into O'Hare. You can't ride out of O'Hare. No, there's lots of airports like that. Yeah, I my experience in Tampa this February was the same thing. Uh, I, I didn't think that it was going to be possible because it's like this giant freeway is your only option to get out of the airport. And it just, you know, that's yeah. just no bueno. Um, but Vegas, man, they, they built it in a weird way. They just plunk it in the middle of the desert and there it is. And it's just, you know, these big wide shouldered highways that sort of whisk you from there to your 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 pickup spot which was going to be the next morning you know how many about how many miles was it to where you had to go and i know you ended up doing a little bit of night riding as a part of it yeah it was about 30 miles um about like two and a half hour two, about two and a half three hours of riding um a good chunk of it was kind of uphill but it was very gradual and it really wasn't a problem um and a thing i did not know about vegas just having never ridden around there is that the roads are, for the most part, very big, huge shoulders. There are actually a lot of bike lanes, even, you know, like a bike lane plus a huge shoulder. And the roads were kept very clear, um, not a lot of debris and potholes and everything. Um, and then there's this huge system of off-road bike trails, I think, because there used to be a lot of um, industry in the desert, whether it's the mines or, you know, huge civil engineering projects like the Hoover Dam. And they had to build these transit infrastructures for for these projects that don't exist anymore so the lands have kind of been turned into nature preserves or protected areas and they just turned you know the old railroads and roads through there into bike trails so it's super easy riding and really well protected and you know, i mean i just didn't i didn't see cars for a really long time which was fantastic like i just went through the desert turned the lights off on my bike there's a full moon and just cruised along for a couple hours i mean it was one of the calmest nicest rides i'd had in a long time that's really cool I, I didn't realize that the rail trails were so prevalent in that part of nevada that's that's pretty fantastic yeah i think if you're working it probably didn't go places you want to go but as a tourist it was fantastic yeah that's really great i mean it, not during the heat of the summer though as we talked about offline yeah, <laughs> no, you can get no. pretty <laughs> nasty pretty nasty so all right so you, you get overnight and you camp out at basically the spot where your outfitter was going to pick you up and and uh, to kind of tell tell the story a little bit for you there i know that you need to get an outfitter to drop you off you had all your gear you didn't need to have anything from the outfitter but because of the licensing and all that other kind of stuff you had to uh um, ha get get that drop off but one of the elements to the story, and by the way, folks, I, I'm going to have a link in the show notes so that you can read this really awesomely written story that, that, that we're hopefully filling in the lines and not stealing any of the good narrative from. But I, you had to inflate your raft prior to getting picked up. That was sort of the deal. And I'm super curious, how does one inflate a raft like that? <laughs> um, and, and, and how do, is it a foot pump or something powered? I'm just really curious. Yeah, it's actually like really kind of ingenious. And I've actually heard a, a podcast with the person who invented it a while back. And basically, the it, it looks like a giant kind of trash bag almost and with a nozzle on the end of it. And you attach a nozzle the same way you would a regular pump and you just fill the bag. So if it's windy, it's kind of nice because you can just put the bag in the wind and it fills with air and you kind of you know twist it off on the top and you just squeeze the air into a raft. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I when I heard a podcast with the person who invented, that's basically what happened. They forgot their pump, and they just had a garbage bag with them, and they, that's what they used, and it worked super well. So it's great because it, it takes up almost no space in your kit. Um, I mean, you could use it as a bag for something else if you really needed to. And it maybe takes like 10, 15 minutes to basically get it fully inflated, like maybe like 20 minutes to get fully inflated, but it's super easy. And the raft itself um, handles, like you first just lock it on and just let it fill. And it doesn't take that much, um, especially if you fill the tubes with some of your gear. There's a lot less space to fill. That's really cool. That's good to know. Um, so outfitter 
takes you down to the river and you're plunked down there and as fate would have it it's during one of the big <laughs> storms of the of this season that we're coming you know i mean yep. nice you're it's raining in the desert just before you're about to pop down on this adventure um how you know where was your sort of frame of mind going into all of this knowing that you had that kind of weather coming because i mean this was sort of your first big adventure on the raft with the bike and all of that like were you like "Mm, is this a bad idea or where, where where was your head at yeah so i i mean i did not grow up in the desert or anywhere near it and i i don't know i think just i read too many adventure stories when i was little about people getting like flooded in deserts and like trapped in places and whatever so this is like one of my biggest fears about going to the desert is drowning honestly like um so it was definitely a little concerning to me but the storm had been predicted um it'd been forecast quite a you know a week or two earlier so i'd been tracking it and kind of preparing for it so i had plenty of warm gear with me um I, I basically, I bivvied while I was out there. So I took a slightly heavier bivvy that I knew, um, like could withstand snow, that I've used in the snow before. So I figured if worst case, I just hang out there and if I get stuck in the snow, then that's great. Um, cause where I was on the river is a bit of low, lower elevation. So it was raining, but the desert floor, it was snowing up there. So that's what was predicted at slightly higher elevations. Um, so I wasn't too concerned with the rain because after the first day, it seemed like it was, it wasn't a heavy, like flash flooding type of rain. It was just kind of a drizzly, like constantly there, which living in the Bay area, I'm around that type of rain all the time. So it wasn't much of an issue, but it was just kind of the, the perpetual cold. Like you don't, you can't just, you just can't get warm at the end of the day very easily. And again, I, I swim in San Francisco Bay like a couple times a week. So getting warm after being in cold damp is not um is not too much of a concern for me these days the bay is like perpetually freezing it feels it seems like exactly. at least so you know the path it sounded like that and i'll have i'll again i'll have people read your your specific experience with the the paddling um but i i i, I think that uh, the biggest or some of the questions that I have for you is just the caloric needs or the caloric differences between cycling and paddling. I know that you ended up hauling several days worth of food with you. And I'm curious if you have a take on whether you're you burned more or you were like hungrier after paddling and then also to sort of pivot into a little bit about kind of the, how you handle eating on on tour or on a on a, a trip like this because it looked like that you had uh an alcohol stove with you and you did some hot food but you also did a little bit of cold soaking so i'm curious sort of when you're having this massive caloric deficit from all of these various things whether you're biking or, or paddling um what how do you kind of approach uh, the choice between making something warm or doing some cold soak, you know, is it, is it sort of mood? Is it, do you have a method to all of this madness? Yeah. So first I'll address the paddling versus cycling difference. And the biggest thing I found actually was because so the first day that I was going to be on the river and the guy, the, the outfitter gave me a lot of advice. Um, and basically what I was concerned about was so it's about a, 12, 12 to 13 mile stretch of river between the put in place at the Hoover Dam and um, this marina um, kind of before the river turns into Lake Mojave. And I wanted to camp near these hot springs that were about four miles down the river. So it should only be a four mile paddle, not that big a deal, except af- that afternoon it was the wing of you know, 30, 40 mile per hour range. So I needed to get off the river before like this, the wind really came in. So I was just paddling as fast as I could pretty much um, and fighting the wind. And because of the dam, there's not much of a current on the river. So the wind is really what determines your speed. So although I was going down river, it did, you know, I was fighting to get down river. So I didn't eat. I really didn't eat at all while I was paddling just because I couldn't stop. Um, and that's one big difference with the bike is like, if you're fighting the wind, you just, you have to keep fighting it. And because it was the morning, I'd only eaten a little bit before. I went on the river. I just, I kind of just started bonking. I, at some point I just pulled off on the, onto the bank and just like sat down and had some food. And it turns out I was actually only like five minute paddle away from where I was planning to camp anyways. But like, I just needed to get off the river. At that That's point. hysterical. Isn't that how it always works? So when you're right around the bend from something, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Exactly. So, and then the next day, I, it was an eight-mile paddle. There really wasn't any wind, so it was much calmer. I could eat a little bit more while I was, while I was on the river. Um, but even that, I think, you know, the first couple of days when I ride, it doesn't seem to translate as hunger. I just get, like, really cranky and really angry. And then I have to sit down and remind myself, like, I'm getting cranky and angry because I'm hungry. And then I eat, and it's totally fine. But um, the second day on the river, the problem was stopping for food, really, just because it was like a cold rain. It was fine as long as I was moving. But as soon as I stopped to eat something, um, you know, you started getting pretty chilled quite quickly. So I just kind of kept paddling and snack. I pulled the snacks out before I got in the boat so I could grab them easily while I was paddling. Yeah, that's what happens on the bike, too. You know, it's like you, you, you're warm, you're fine, exactly. and then all of a sudden you stop just to, to get a drink of water or something like that, and you, your body temperature drops when it's conditions like that. So it's the same idea. Yeah. One thing that is easy on the river, sorry. Yeah, one thing that is easier on the river is that um, I had a water bottle with a filter in it, so I never had to worry about water. Um, I could drink as much as I wanted to, and just if I was empty, just dip the bottle back in the river and just keep drinking. That's pretty convenient. I can't think of an analogy yeah. in bicycling that's even remotely like that. That's great. Yeah, it was very uh, nice. That, that's that's pretty awesome. All right. So, um, when you're at it, you're in camp, say, and you had a couple of different camps, there were instances where you boiled up stuff with the alcohol stove. There were times when you just did some cold soaking. And I'm curious if there, like I mentioned before, is there a method to your madness with all of that? Is it based on mood? And sort of, you know, how, how do you, how do you figure out how you're going to eat and what you're going to eat? Yeah. So I think somewhat counterintuitively, like most of my friends who have stoves, um, you know, they like them for one in cold conditions because it helps them warm up. Um, I've always been very comfortable in the cold. And so I've actually never, this is the first camping trip where I cooked for myself. Um, I've always been a cold soaker or just like sandwiches and everything. And part of it is like in California, especially when we had drought for a drought for a really long time, I wasn't in places where we had access to fresh water. So bringing dehydrated food wasn't a weight savings because I would have had to pack in the water to rehydrate it. So I've always been much more of just like a bring a lot of chocolate and some tuna fish and some mayonnaise. It's like all super calorie dense, fairly healthy, like, you know, a big block of cheese. And that's always kind of been my, my food preference. Um, this trip, because, because I'm going to go out to Scandinavia for the summer and restaurant food is just obscenely expensive out there. Uh, I figured I should probably get myself a stove and learn how to, you know, cook my own, my own meals on the road. So part of this trip really was just trying to like learn to use a stove and just become more comfortable with it so that when I end up in Scandinavia cooking for myself, it's not going to be as big of a deal. But like when I got off the river, I was, you know, getting kind of cold and chilled. And that's when I just, I just ate a chocolate bar for dinner because it's the fastest way to get warm. Um, You know, the sugar just like really kind of gets your metabolism going and gets your body warm again. So that was the biggest thing. But the first night, um, I was, it was pretty chilly. It was, I was at much higher elevation. It, the snow was starting. It was going to start probably the next day. And making myself a hot water bottle to snuggle up with at night was like, that definitely sold having a stove with me. So uh, as we mentioned, this was a tune-up for this grand Scandinavian adventure. And I'm just curious what were the takeaways that you had from this bike rafting trip and how do you see them applying to the, the, the grander adventure, the bigger Scandinavian Arctic circle adventure? Yeah. So this was definitely like, I think a bit more kind of self-reliant than I, I think I'll need to be in Scandinavia just because I'm sticking to roads and everything. So even though it's a little bit, it's a bit less densely populated than the Vegas metro area, um, there's a lot more kind of, corner stores and gas stations and stuff along the way so it was good to kind of get an idea like how much food am I realistically eating in like a two-day period and for me again probably because I spend so much time in San Francisco Bay and like we're just constantly kind of worrying about hypothermia um it's good to know that like this trip was in conditions that were probably colder and somewhat wetter than I would actually expect to find in Scandinavia for the summer. So it was kind of a, an edge case type of thing. Um, the bike rafting, 
again, rougher conditions than I'd expect to see because mostly, mostly what I'm planning on having the RAF or out there so there's just a lot of like lakes and stuff around um so i could go camp on some of the islands and explore more that way so i'm the type of person that likes to kind of take you go on these adventures but i get very cautious and like want to make sure that i'm taking as much preparation or that i'm doing as much preparation as i need to get to where i'm i feel safe and a lot of that is because i do this stuff by myself like i don't have as much of a safety cushion as if you were with three or four other people that could see you capsize and want to rescue you um so in that case like i found the boat handled much better than i expected it would and it packed down it i kind of figured out a decent way to stash it on my bike like i I put it in a dry bag and then lashed the dry bag on top of my panniers like a kind of across um like across the back of it and it it worked super well well, Maggie, thanks for, so much for coming on the show and talking about this uh, this adventure and the adventures to come. I would love to have you back on the show if you're if you're willing to tell the stories of your Scandinavian yeah. adventure too. If you'd if you'd be willing, um, how can folks follow along on your adventures and more, more importantly, your writing? Because I think that you're an awesome uh, writer. I, I I really felt like I was transported there. So many travel journals, not the not you listeners, you listener who are who do lots of travel blogging. Yours is awesome too. I'm not talking about you, but many aren't as good. So, but yours is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. uh, tell people where they can read yourself. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So it's at hiccupingyogi.com. Um, not the most intuitive title for a uh, bike touring blog effectively, but it, it was my old, my old business website when I was teaching yoga. So um, yeah. So hiccupingyogi.com. Yeah. And, and it's got a great story behind it. So you should, should read it at least for all of that. So Maggie, thanks so much for joining the show. And I'm looking forward to reading more about your adventures. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I wanted to thank Maggie once again for coming on the show. I'm really looking forward to chatting with her again about some of the other adventures that are coming up, especially that one in the Arctic Circle in Europe. That sounds really, really cool. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention that we didn't actually get into at all, which is rare for us. Uh, I am famously an alum of Syracuse University. She went to Georgetown, which is the the death uh, arrival of Syracuse. And we often get on each other about uh, basketball. And the fact that it didn't happen was kind of a minor miracle. Turns out that very day that we did the interview, Syracuse and Georgetown just re-upped for a four-year renewal of the rivalry now that they're in different conferences. So that was kind of meant to be, I think. And go Orange. And as always, we'd like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community expanding into live shows, meetups, and tour journals. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot in annual options if you're not into the small monthly thing. Check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lane. Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Dittus, Thomas Skadow, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Tell Goddess, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Stuart Buckin, Todd Stutz, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Paul Culbertson, Scott Culbertson, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Richard Patch, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Dave Roll, Joseph Quinn, Susan Brewster, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robber, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Henkel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Avilas Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gebhardt, Jody Zoranin, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Biggle, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, and new to the society, William Goffman, Brian Benton, and Joan Churchill. And thanks also to all past and anonymous contributors for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album, track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available. 